good? Okay, good. good morning, everybody. Welcome to our chapter class. We're going to do a wedding class today, learn about how to conduct a wedding and how to do a wedding rehearsal. And we'll talk a little bit about um, kind of premarital uh, counseling, how to kind of be able to talk with someone, share a little bit about before they actually get married. If someone asks you to marry them, you can give them some marital advice. And then we're going to talk about covenant marriage license. I don't know. How many of you know what a covenant marriage license is? Have you ever heard of that? Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit. The state of Arizona, which I think is awesome, has uh, put that into law. And you can either do a covenant marriage license or a regular marriage license, but we'll talk about what a covenant marriage license is. And we try to uh, ask people if we're marrying them to actually do a covenant marriage license. And I'll explain We'll explain what that is as we get as we go through here. So, so. But the other thing I want to do just to do a um, quick announcement. Remember, next Saturday, for all of you that are in chaplain and training class, this is a, a class that Pastor Greg is going to do. We'll be doing that in the Life Center, and uh, we'll be doing that at night from nine to twelve. And it's called sermon prep, and so it's a sermon prep class. So all you guys need to be there. That's a required. Class, and then I'm going to send a, I don't know if I send an email out to our other chaplains yet, but anyway, I'll do that this week, and those who might want to come can do that. But this is uh, Pastor Greg's way of actually being able to see the chaplains before we actually graduate everybody or move you on to the move you on to the next level. And the only way he can do it because he's preaching on Sundays is we have to do a Saturday class. So, so we'll do that uh, Saturday class next Saturday from nine twelve. Be a continental breakfast type thing. So. And then we'll do it on sermon prep. So, and really, I invited the internship class and anybody that ever really needs to speak or will ever speak in front of uh, someone, especially in regards to uh, scriptural basis or whatever. This is an excellent class on how to study. And Pastor Greg just does an awesome, awesome job on, on helping us uh, take the um, fear factor out of uh, how to prepare a little sermon. And then all of you guys that are in the chaplain and training class, the following, the next couple of Sundays, I think, I think not that not that Sunday, but the next two Sundays, we'll actually have you guys prepare a small message, and you guys will do that here in the in the class. So it's just part of the chaplain training class because you, you you're going to have to get up and talk. You have to be in front of people. So uh, everybody was shaking in their boots every year I've done this so far, but they, everybody ends up just jamming and does an excellent excellent job. So. All right, I'm going to open this with a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll get rolling here on our weddings. Father, we just uh, we just bless you today. Lord, just thank you, God, for just a beautiful day outside today. Lord, I, I just pray the healing power of the blood of Jesus over every person's life here this morning. God, I, I pray that every form of sickness and disease would be healed in Jesus' name, that, God, our bodies would be strengthened. And, Lord, I, I just thank you for every class that's going on, every teacher Lord, Pastor Greg, Pastor Anthony is going to worship. We just speak your blessings uh, over their lives. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, this would be a day where people would walk in freedom, where people, God, would be able to receive joy. And God, we just pray that over our entire campus. God, we just speak your blessings over every area, every ministry. And just thank you, God, that your peace always abides here in this house. Lord, we just love you this morning, God. We just pray all of these things this morning in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Hi, Carl and Carrie. It's good to see you guys. It seems like I haven't seen you guys in like forever, man. I know, we, since I do the 9 o'clock, you guys are in the 9 o'clock service, right? And you guys are teaching and stuff. So I just talked to Cher. I said, Is Carl and Carrie, they still around? I mean, I know y'all are. I just haven't seen you guys in a while, so welcome. Um, Carl and Carrie, grab a. Uh, Steve or somebody, just uh, hand them uh, some inserts here so they can kind of follow along with what we're doing here and stuff. As you see, I've given you guys, I've copied out a, 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 all of that. A whole the whole thing. thing. Is, yep. Yep. Yeah, everybody gets one of those. As you can see, i printed out a book uh, for you guys. Yes. Um, but the, the reason it's uh, so thick is you've got uh, this uh, covenant, uh, preparing for a covenant marriage, which is a... Uh, <coughs> Uh, we can use that. Uh, we use it as like a premarital counseling type of a thing. Of course, y'all know if you're not a, uh, a licensed counselor, you're not really a counselor. You're doing uh, pastoral uh, care, you know, type of thing. Uh, coaching is basically what what I call it. But this is a really cool book. We'll we'll talk about this a little bit. Then the other thing is I have printed out for you uh, what the uh, 
uh, laws and regulations uh, from Maricopa County, or actually from the state, and in regards to a covenant marriage license, what it is, what does it mean, and uh, once you start doing weddings, if somebody does uh, want to do a covenant marriage license, you have to be able to explain what a covenant marriage license is, mm -hmm. because they have to take uh, some documentation with them when they go into the state to actually get their marriage license. Mm -hmm. Number one says uh, a statement or a letter, which is it's in here, it's all written out, but it's a, a statement saying that you had premarital counseling and doesn't you know really say eight weeks, four weeks, six weeks. They, you just need to have done some premarital counseling with them, and that they know that when they get a covenant marriage license that they can't just get a quickie divorce. That's what this thing helps prevent. Uh, they have to do counseling. Uh, it takes over a year or so to do the process. And uh, it really just kind of helps to build uh, strong marriages. And I just bless God. I don't, I don't know when uh, Arizona actually adopted this in as a law, but we're one of the states that have covenant marriages license uh, actually in the state of Arizona. So... Okay, well that was free right there. I should have just started going down my list, but we'll talk about this as we go along. But you're, here, here's where we're going to kind of start. This is like a cover page where it says weddings. And then you'll have another thing that says like wedding notes. So you've got weddings and you've got a page that says wedding notes. Those are going to kind of be the, the pages that we uh, uh, kind of key off of and talk. And then I'll go through this covenant, preparing for a covenant marriage just real briefly and stuff, and then I'll go for the, the, the covenant marriage license and explain that. But let me just start reading up here at the top in regards to weddings. A wedding is a very, very powerful service, and you've been invited to participate in joining two separate lives, lives together in a holy union, becoming one in the eyes of God. That's the whole thing all the way back at the very beginning in Genesis where it says that he shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto uh, his wife and stuff. So... And when they join those two together, it says, and the two shall become one. And uh, that's um, the very first prophetic word all the way back um, uh, in the, the book of Genesis. But whenever you do a, a marriage, I always look at it like this. You know, there's, there's a lot of busyness that goes on with weddings, with everything from cakes to flowers to, gosh, if I just start naming them all, but everything that goes on. But the, the real thing, when you... The person who's actually conducting the service, you always want to keep in mind, you know, what you're doing. You are joining uh, in the spirit realm, in the mm -hmm. eyes of God and everybody else that's around. You're joining those two lives into one life, and uh, it's a it's a powerful, powerful thing. So I'll talk to you a little bit more when we get down into the uh, what the, how the service goes. But I have um, I'll just like all the chaplains in training. When you guys graduate, you guys will. And I don't know if we've done this with every chaplain training or, or chaplains that have graduated, but whenever you become uh, uh, licensed, so all of you that are second-year chaplains will uh, get a book for you guys that has weddings, funerals, and stuff. We Carl, did. did we do that with, yeah, with we you did. guys? Yeah, we have our Okay. All right. Did we you did. guys get that already? Yeah. Okay. So when you graduated, we bought this book. Mm -hmm. So, okay. But this has got, uh, gosh, funeral services, memorial services, uh, dedication services, Basically, it's just it's called a Christian manual, is what it's a uh, Christian handbook. But I got the the format or the wedding that I put together that that I use. I, I use this little book here, and one of the copies we'll we'll go over a little bit later. You've got a copy of what I think Bob May put this together. He typed out basically verbatim what he would actually say when he's standing in, in front of someone. Which, if you haven't done very many weddings and or funerals, is probably a really good idea. Because when you are getting ready to stand in front of a crowd, whether it's a joyous occasion about a wedding or maybe uh, more of a solemn occasion when you're doing a funeral, it's good to have your footnotes in, in front of you. Uh, you sure hate to forget what the name of the person in the casket is when you're speaking and or if the husbands and wives that you're marrying together and uh, you forget, you space the lady's name or the guy's name or whatever, that is just not a good place where you want to be. So I'll show you my book here in a little bit. I've got it marked up really, really, really good. But it's a really an honor. This is an honor and a privilege that they've chosen you to conduct a ceremony. And this is a wonderful opportunity to bless and unite this couple in the eyes of God and all of their friends and their family members. Okay, let's talk about premarital counseling. So let's say um, someone is called or, or maybe you've got a friend or whatever. Or, um, however that is, the church uh, might say, hey, can you do this wedding? 
what we'll do is we want to do a little bit of premarital counseling. And what I've, what I've done before, this is what this book is right here. Just kind of take this book. Let's look at it here for just a second. The very, uh, the very, very first thing on this very first page, page number one, in the, the second paragraph, what you can see is it says, remember that the wedding lasts an afternoon, but your marriage is going to last a lifetime. So what I do sometimes, I'm right here in this, uh, right here in this covenant book here, I'm on the very, very first page, um, the middle, the middle section here. I always remind the couple that uh, as I, when I give them this book, that you know you've got all these things that you're doing, but will you guys please sit down during the week and read this book and then answer these questions? Here's what I tell them to answer these questions, and then if you find any places where you kind of got stuck or you had a hiccup or you had an argument or whatever, then that's a place where when we come back together, I want to sit down and I'll, I'll talk with you guys. Otherwise, you could actually do premarital counseling. You could do premarital counseling for like six weeks, eight weeks, um, if you went through every single topic that's here. And you usually just don't have six to eight weeks. A lot of times when you get a wedding or a call for a wedding, you really want to do it fairly fairly quickly, and you don't really have a lot of time, which is even kind of this, this statement that... Um, morning, Beatrice. Good morning. Uh, the statement that uh, Pastor Greg makes here is, you know, you plan, 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 and plan for a wedding, but when you actually get ready to do that, how much have you really planned on, you know, talking about yourself, preparing yourself... Because there is no manual on uh, what do you do when you get married. There's no 101, um, you know, I'm living with this person now. And, you know, and usually when you're dating and courting and all that stuff, everything, well, hopefully everything is roses. If it's not roses, it will not be better when you get married. It will go even further south, I'll just tell you. I'll just explain that to you. Because how a person acts or how a person reacts, and I'm telling you this, not, not for you, but I'm telling you this, so if you're sitting in front of a person, you know, type of thing. Well, they'll get better, or I'll be able to change them. The answer to that is absolutely no way, no way, no way that will will that happen. Because basically, true character will eventually uh, end up coming out. And the and the only way a person will change is if God actually heals that person's heart. Mm -hmm. You know, saying I'll get better, saying I'm going to do this better, unless something they unless they actually do something to better themselves, and it has you know with God or through counseling or something like that. Folks, they won't, they'll not get better. It, it just gets worse. And I've, I've done this for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. And a lot of people uh, uh, have these grandiose, you know, things in their eyes, which they should, especially if they're falling in love with someone. And you, you really, you know, uh, take it with a grain of salt. And you're a lot, lot, lot more forgiving. But I just caution you guys, as you guys will talk with people, if you see people that, you know, they're already having problems, that it will not get better. And there's been a couple of times that I've done premarital counseling. And I said, you know what, I don't really think you guys should get married. My advice is you need to do some more counseling. You guys need to get healing yourselves. Because mm -hmm. here, here's, here's the other deal. To, to tell a couple to get counseling mm -hmm. is one thing. But what really needs to happen before a couple gets counseling is that individual needs to get counseling. Because that's usually their problems as a couple stem from how this person sees life. Or how this, or how the wife sees life, and to get counseling, say you need to communicate. That's fine, but if nothing gets healed in that person's individual life, you still will have uh, the conflict when when you got two people. So that's just a little bit, a little bit of advice on when you're counseling someone. The other thing that I look very, very carefully at: if people are of another faith, mm. I usually really counsel them very, very strongly not to not to get married. Um, I've had uh, a couple of different times when that. When that's happening, and what I mean by uh, faith, I'm talking about um, uh, like a Christian and a Muslim, or something like that. And uh, I'm not down in any other um, uh, religions or anything like that. I'm just saying because the cultures are so different, you're going to come into a lot of problems. You'll have a lot of problems. You know, what is what do the holidays look like? What does Easter yeah. look like? What does Christmas look like? What do the birthdays look like? Just just little things you don't even really think about. <coughs> That the cultures are so different that you actually you can be married to this person but have culture shock as you're as you're going through a, a marriage. Same thing with a, an unbelieving or a believing, and maybe I should have just stated it that way: a believing or an unbelieving spouse. Okay, so if the person's the couple that you're marrying, if you know that they're not born again, the very next, the very first thing Pastor Greg puts on here, it says you know building upon the rock. The very first thing that he's telling them to read and do is to become born again. 
because it, it, God is going to be your only source of help and refuge uh, through this thing. God can heal, God can restore, God can make things new, you know, but just going to a counselor or this and that and secular counseling or whatever, that might help, but God is the one that actually heals. And the thing is, if a person's heart is not enlightened um, and not born again, you're going to run mm -hmm. to some you know, problems. Will they go to church? Where are you going to take the kids to church? Uh, are you going to raise the kids in church? You just you run into all kinds of uh, uh, scenarios. So the very the very first thing here that uh, Pastor Greg is is touching on is um, building upon the rock. And and you know I don't know if you, you're taking notes or whatever, but on this little page right here, what I put is where will you go to church? I just I, I that's the very first thing because I just kind of highlight this thing when I ask him to read it. You know, where will you guys go to church? Are you going to church? Do you guys pray together? Even as a, uh, a couple, when they're kind of uh, just getting together, I say, do you guys, have you guys established uh, any time where you pray together and stuff? So I just, I'll ask them questions like that. The next, the next uh, section is uh, page five. Is this the fourth Sunday? The fourth, the fourth Sunday, they do a baptismal class at ten forty-five. In that same, in that same room, yeah. But the, uh, it is the, this is the fourth, this is twenty-second, yeah. So it's a baptism. No, you know what? That's right. No, this. This is the third. No, this is the fourth, but. Um, I don't know. She announced members on yeah, Sunday. Yeah, so. they finished last. So then this is, then this would be bap this would be baptism then. So it's. Uh huh. I'm looking at my calendar here. Yeah. So they announced because they announced the membership last time. So mm -hmm. this will be the baptism class, which is second second service, and then and then the very first of um, you know because that's going to be um, Easter Sunday. Oh, they're not doing it with Easter Sunday. They'll start on the twelfth. They'll start on the twelfth. Twelfth April. Sorry. Should she try to maybe go to the baptism? Sure. That'd be awesome. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, um, what was I saying? Where will you go to church? Where will you go to church? Are you praying together? Okay, that's the very first thing. So that's a building upon the rock. And then over on page five, it's, it talks about how well do you communicate. And um, one, one of the things is um, that, that I put down there is I asked them, how do you handle conflict? I wrote that question down. How do you handle conflict? Have you guys gotten a fight yet? You know, yes, we did. Okay, well, let's talk. I'll talk about it. We'll talk about it next week. But I want you, want you to read here on how you communicate, and then answer these questions together, and then write down some things. And usually the guys don't write down nothing. Uh, but anyway, you still can try to pull information from them. But I just try to encourage them um, to write down things. But I'll ask them, have you seen the other person angry? Um, you know, what caused the problem? How would you resolve it? And I'll just, I'll just say stuff like that. But it's how you communicate. And then, um, well, then you can just kind of go through this thing. But write, write down this... Um, Write down this thing at the very front of your book. This is something that I always start with whenever I'm doing a counseling thing. And, and again, I just go through this whole book and I kind of show them what it is and ask them to answer the questions. And then what I'll do is, when they've done that, then I'll meet with them again and I'll go through the book and answer any of the questions or help them through. And that's, you, that's usually the type of premarital counseling that I do. Unless someone gives me a lot of time, and then I have a whole other uh, deal where it's uh, called... Um, Oh gosh, I forget the name of the, the network, but anyway, it's about uh, 200 and some odd questions where we actually do a survey, and then I actually sit down and do about five meetings with them if they give me if they give me plenty of time. But we do not have a ministry here at Skyway right now that is a premarital counseling ministry. We don't have that. So usually the pastor that's doing or the chaplain that's doing the wedding, if they do any premarital counseling, they're the ones that would do the premarital counseling. Carrie, um, before we start writing in the book, will we get one of these to be able to give to the couple? Yes, I can okay. give you guys. So this is these are like your guys' books. Okay. So you can write in there. And we, anything that you see here, I can duplicate for you because we have masters of all of this. So if you start doing weddings, if you start, you know, when you do funerals, those type of things, whatever, maybe you took a bunch of notes and there's something you want to hand to, like uh, Carrie's saying, uh, hand to the family or something like that, we'll get you, we'll get you clean copies, you know, of all that stuff. Okay. But one of the things that I ask, this is why I do this. Whenever, if you're marrying someone, hopefully that person's never going to get a divorce. That was my thought when I, uh, when I started doing my, my weddings. As a matter of fact, my very first couple got a divorce. 
uh, type of thing. So that was kind of a, a bummer because, you know, you know, all the promises they made, those type of things, you know, you want them to see them stay together. But here's something that I, uh, I ask them this question, and I, and I write it down, and I stick it in a file in case I ever talk to them again. But I, I asked them, I said, how did you guys meet? I just said, how did you guys meet? So I'll ask them that question. This is when everything's good. This is when everything's happy. This is when they can't wait to get married. And, and so, so how do you guys meet? How long ago? I asked them that question. You know, and then I put, what was your first thought of him and or of her? What was your first thought? And then, I, then the other question I ask is, um, well, I don't want to ask that question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you do. laughs> Basically is, um, why do you like being around this person? That's kind of, that's, why do you like being with this person? So that way, you know, they make me laugh, they're funny, they're humorous, they compliment me, they... So what I do with just those three, those three questions, I write their answers down. And there's been probably, out of the number of weddings I've done, there's probably been four or five times when I've been able to go back and they were going through some problems. I was able to go back to them and I would say, do you remember, you know, 12 years ago when you sat in my office and I asked you some questions? And they're like staring down. <laughs> no, we don't want to remember it. But anyway, you're able to bring back to why they did what they did. Why did you marry this person? That's good. You know, and you kind of bring them back to that. There's a lot of water that goes under the bridge. There's a lot of hurt and pain that goes under the bridge after years and years and years and stuff. But do you remember why you did this? Because that person is the same person. And they would say, no, that person's not the same person. Well, okay. Yeah, they are, but maybe things have changed because things of life changed. But that person, the reason you met that person, the reason you liked that person, uh, you know, when did you meet them? How long ago? What do you like about that person? Do they make you laugh? That person's still the same thing, but things can happen in their life that makes changes. And those are just those are some of the things when I'm doing premarital that I that I write down, and that way I can use them again whenever I'm talking with a person to kind of help them go through. Hey, why are they doing what they're doing? What happened? What? what how did things go south? But that's a very very simplistic kind of I just very uh, simple way of doing uh, the marriage counseling. But this whole book is just an excellent book. I have them read it, have them fill out, and answer the questions. And then I sit back and then I meet with them again. So that's usually what the premarital uh, thing is. And then what I'll do is when they're when I'm doing the premarital thing, I will talk to them about this covenant marriage. And I'll say, would you guys like to, to have a covenant marriage license? And guess what their answer is to me? What's that? What is a covenant marriage license exactly? So you have you have this here where you can begin to explain a covenant marriage license is exactly the same cost. It's the same. Uh, type of thing as a regular marriage license other than this is a uh, covenant, again, binding contract that you can't just put an ad in the paper, pay a few hundred dollars, and get a, and get a divorce, which is kind of how things can happen nowadays. Uh, irreconcilable discipline, uh, differences, that, that's all you have to say. You don't have to say why, who, what, when, or where. <clears throat> if, you, if you have them do a covenant marriage license, the judge will not issue uh, a decree of divorce. They have to go. They have to go through premarital counseling. They have to counsel for over a year. Uh, the person has to be abandoned for uh, X number of period of times, two years. You can read through this. I'm not, I won't teach uh, this thing, but whenever you do premarital counseling, you want to be able to explain to them. Bottom line is, you can't. The first two, three pages of this covenant thing will basically give you the understanding as you're talking to the couple when they get this uh, premarital, uh, when they get this covenant marriage license. The other thing is they have to fill out a statement that they actually understand what a covenant marriage license is. And then you as the chaplain or the pastor that's doing this, you have to issue, you have to write a letter, get it notarized, and sign it saying that I, had, I did do premarital counseling with them and I did read to them and they understand uh, the rules and the regulations. In, and I've got a copy of that, so if you ever need a copy of that, I can give you a copy of that letter that we use here at, at the church. But they have to take that letter with them when they go in to get the marriage license, okay? And if someone that's been married and they hear about the covenant marriage license and they go, I would like, I would like to have a covenant marriage license. They can go back in and actually get, after you've been married, you can go back in and get a covenant, you can get a covenant marriage license. So you can do that. I, it's a 
I don't know what the filing fee is, but you know, I don't know it's probably what the, what the license costs probably. What is the license? Is it sixty-five bucks or more than that, or seventy-five? Okay. So anyway, uh, so even a person, if they hear about that and they've already been married, but they say, you know what, I really love what I hear about this covenant marriage license. I'd like to go and get that. They can go and get a covenant marriage license, and then they can renew their vows if they'd like to do that and resign. Sheree. You know, something really cool about um, just about Texas. In Texas, if you do that, if you go through marriage counseling, your licenses, there's no cost. Oh, really? If you get premarital, yeah. I'll be done yeah. So they really promote they the fact they want people to go through premarital counseling. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Carl? Maybe we can adopt that here. Mm -hmm. This is just for Arizona, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing this is Arizona. because each, you know, each different state, as, you know, Cherie said, I didn't know that about Texas. But they all have different statutes, and I don't know if every state has covenant marriage license. I don't think everybody has adopted that. So we put that into law, and I don't know if it says that in the first few pages, but um, it'll tell you what the law is and what the regs is. But that is strictly Arizona. So if you do something like, Carl, I know you guys go to California a lot or whatever. I don't know what what California is. You would just need to check with them and see you know, what they have. Do they have? you know, a um, covenant marriage license that people can get. If not, it's just a regular marriage license. Okay? okay. Yeah, Skyly, do you find yourself doing more covenant um, marriages? Yeah, because what we try to do is we really try to ask them. So if you guys start doing uh, weddings or whatever, I always ask them first, would you like to do a covenant marriage license? And, of course, they don't know what that means. And then when you explain what that means, it's the same cost. Um, there's, they don't really have to do anything extra. They're already going to get some premarital counseling. I haven't had anybody yet say, "No, nah, I really don't want to get that one," you know, because the majority of the people that we're we're uh, counseling or we're marrying are, are Christian normally, and um, so I haven't had anybody say that they didn't want to. So yeah, a lot of the ones that we do, we're doing a covenant marriage license. Out of curiosity, somebody my age, getting close to seventy-five, do they have to go through this? I'm if, amused just if, because of if my If they're age. getting married or something like that? Yeah, old yeah. people. <laughs> yes, well, if, if they're getting married, I will ask them, do they want to do, if, especially if they've been married before, they got kids, blah, blah, blah. Do, uh -huh. Would they want to do uh, premarital counseling? I haven't had anyone of that age say, no. That, that, uh -huh, okay. they, no, they've said, no, yeah. we, don't, we don't need to do that. Oh, they've mm -hmm. said, we don't need to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, matter of fact, I did one wedding not too long ago. Here's the, here's the thing. you got to kind of choose what you want to do, but there's been times when... You know, who will you marry or whatever. We had a couple that had wasn't really going to church or whatever. They were here in the community because we were the church. They called and said, uh, you know, could they do a wedding? And they talked to, they start with Jackie. And, and um, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, when do you want to do that? I want to do that today. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so this is um. 9 in the morning and they want to do it today, like 11 o'clock or whatever. Wow. And so, number one, Jackie's like, well, I don't Maybe know if we can do that. You know, the other thing is, you know, why didn't they just go to a JP, you know, or something like, you know, something like that. But when someone will call, when someone will call the church and they um, want to get married in a church because there's some type of, uh, they just feel, hey, that's the thing they need to do because there's this connection with God or whatever. I, I will, if they'll sit down and talk with me just for a few minutes, I'll go ahead and do the wedding. And it just so happened it was a Tuesday or Thursday, which are my... Uh, you know, best days where I don't have as many meetings uh, that are that are you know uh, put mm -hmm. in there. And I actually, I actually married a couple that lived right back over here. He was, he was eighty something. She Whoa. was seventy something. No, they yeah. didn't have time to wait. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, yeah, but, but who knows their yeah, medical history? So they came in. I talked to them. I talked to them. They let me pray for them. I talked to them about God and, and how to do that. And, you know, establish those things, and uh, they came in, and, and we mar I married them in the sanctuary. It was just, mm -hmm. a matter of fact, I did, did mm -hmm. Michelle, did you or someone else come in? And yeah. Somebody came in, we had witnesses. I, saw, I was a witness, and I accidentally misspelled February on there. <laughs> That's what I remember. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll remember to find you on a Tuesday or Wednesday. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and, and of course you have to have someone that's, you know, that are that witnessing that you'll be able to sign. But there have been times when I've done weddings just, you know, off the cuff like that type of thing. But, you know, main thing, if I can interject God in there, if it's like, hey, you know what? Because some church will just go, no, we won't marry you. We won't marry you. And... And, and they have, you know, reasons why they don't do that stuff. But I'm thinking, you know, if, if you can reach out, if I can make a touch, if I can, you know, if they feel like, you know, hey, well, that, that guy was cool. He, 
went ahead and married us. Well, that church is cool. Maybe we should check that church out. You just never know where that where that thing will go. I did a I did a wedding one time at uh, Tuli's on 43rd Avenue in Indian School. I don't know if you know what Tuli's is. Yeah, it's a bar. And a lot of a lot of times people go, well, why did why did you go there with this holy you know type of a thing? Well, I met with a couple beforehand. The the husband got born again, and. Uh, I didn't know where they were doing the wedding at the, at the time, but I kind of did some premarital. But he got born again. I did the thing, and they wanted to do it at Tuli's. And I said, oh, okay, I, I'll do it. And I tell you what, I, the, the, the peace and the presence of God came in that. It's a, it's a, cow, it's a um, country western type of place, huge dance floor where they do dances. And what they did was, I didn't know they were going to do this, but they turned the screens on, the big, huge screen. So the wedding was on a big, huge screen. And, of course, there are people, you know, they're playing pool in the background. you got, you know, glasses clinking around. They're drinking and stuff. And, you know, it's, it, it's in the afternoon, like, you know, 3 or something like that. It's on a Saturday. But when I did the, when I started doing the wedding, the whole wow. bar cool, cool, cool. Pff, yeah. wow. stopped. Yeah. And no one told him stop. Right. I mean, because they're the, I, that place is huge. I don't know if you've ever been in it or not. But um, man, I opened it up. I prayed the power of the blood of Jesus oh, over every person. Yeah. I prayed over every every marriage that was in that place. I you know, I mean, it was cool. I was cool with it. You know, I didn't have to go all crazy. I was preach, but they knew that we, there was a wedding going on, and in Jesus' name was that thing being. Uh, conducted. Wow. So, you know, I did the did the wedding vows, and it was totally quiet while that was going on and stuff. And, uh, of course, I said, you know, after it got done, and I pronounced the husband and wife, and they wanted me to stay. Hey, Gabe, you want to stay and just kind of hang with us, party a little bit? And I said, no, got some things to do. It was really great. Thank you for, you know, letting me do the wedding. And, and, I, and, I, and I left. I excused myself. But as I was walking out, I had three people um, uh, grab me as I was going out the door. Wow. And one man grabbed me, and he mm -hmm. goes, I'm separated from my wife. He goes, I'm going back today. I'm leaving right now. I'm going to talk to him. So, you know, you never know what would go on, you know, type of thing when you just, you know, in Jesus' name, you know, you don't have to be religious. You just carry, we carry, you know, the Holy Spirit with us wherever we go. And, and so, yeah, I had a lot of people question, why are you going to do that and this and that? And I go, you know, I just... You know, the guy got born again, and you know, because the thing is, well, don't you know that's a bar and they drink? And it's like, you know, yeah. come on, you know, you know how many people probably drink after you yep. leave anyway, you know? <laughs> and I didn't say, I didn't say that to people, but, but you just gotta, you know, the thing is, what we, you know, you're watering, you're harvesting, you're planting, you just never really know what you're doing at the time you're doing it. And maybe every single time you don't dilate and, and get a home run, you know, but you might be plowing rocks at that time. So, Obviously, at the Tuli's thing, I felt like I was plowing some rocks, but there was some fruit, so there was a harvest. And, you know, what happened with the guy in his marriage, I don't know, but, you know, the fact that the guy said, hey, it, you know, so if it touched him and that guy reached out and said something, who else uh, in there did that, that thing, you know, that thing touch? So, again, I just say that in case you ever come up with a question, they're wanting to be married in a certain place or whatever, you know, hey, that's, that's fine. And, you know, well, they're going to serve alcoholic beverages. Well, you know, they're going to serve it, whether it's you or it's a J. So you know what? Take God in there. Take the presence in there. Do what you do, what God's called you to do. And then bottom line, who's the one that, that convicts people of sin, righteousness, and judgment anyway? The Holy Spirit. Okay, it's not even us. So uh, we're going to carry them. We're going to share them. I was just thinking as you were sharing that, you know, there was wine. Or actually, Jesus turned the water into wine. So he made a provision for the people for the wedding. So we, and that kind of throws out that religious mindset right yeah. there. And whenever we speak the word of the Lord, the Holy Spirit falls upon the people. Yeah. And that's all we need to be concerned about is giving the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to manifest. Yeah. And you, usually a, a funeral is even a, a, a greater time where we have that opportunity to speak because people are thinking about life after death. Where am I going to go when I die? That's the greatest opportunity in, in what Carrie's saying. But even in a wedding... Um, with the vows that are being read that, that you're asking them, and we'll, we'll get into that here in just a second, but um, I do the, the, the wedding portion where it says, and I give you my promise. Now, you might not teach what a promise is or what a covenant is, but it's not just like, well, I promise. You know, it, it's, it's you're cutting covenant with this person and death, mm -hmm. death to his heart, and you're doing this between, in the eyes of God and everybody that's there. So, you know, depending on what happens after the wedding is, 
is over, which is what that whole covenant uh, book is about, you know, helping them prepare for that. But the bottom line is you're releasing, like Carrie said, the presence of God. And those words are very powerful, powerful words when a person is speaking promises into another into another person's life. Amen. And we have the privilege and the honor to be able to lead them in that. Therese? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so my question. Okay. My question is that, um, so you talked about, you know, doing an off-site wedding. Right. So um, as we're licensed then, is that here in Arizona? Mm -hmm. And anywhere in Arizona. There are different, you can, when, whenever, if you get called anywhere in Arizona, but if you get called to do something in another state, you just need to check with them, hey, I'm licensed out of Arizona, is that, does that okay with the state that you're able to sign that marriage license? And a lot of times, a lot of times it is, I know I've done some in California, but just check with it anyway, because I don't want to say I know exactly positively for sure, but my understanding is you're a licensed minister. Carl, you got yeah, it. Pastor Gray clarified that with us one day. We had a meeting with him, and he okay. said our license is good anywhere in the United States. Okay, all right. So it's good anywhere in the United States. Yes. They just have to. They just have to get a marriage license in the state that you're actually doing the right. wedding. So they're doing it in Texas, they're in California, blah blah blah. Okay. Um, but yeah, if that's the case, and I thought it was that we were licensed to do it just anywhere. So okay, we'll go to Katrina, and then we'll go to Irene. I, was, I just wanted to share with my younger brother, who's a non-believer, he had visited the church I attended a couple times, and he really connected with my pastor. Every time he came, the message would be about his life, <laughs> God mm -hmm. but he still, to this day, has will not profess Christ and has not still in limbo. But anyway, he um, lives in New York, and he asked my pastor to marry him, and he flew he and his wife in. And they got married, and they went through counseling with them. Now, this is a non-believer, professed right. non-believer, but he's receiving this spiritual guidance. And all he's seeing is a, my brother is very uh, strong about what man he, he's low on the respect totem pole, right. put it like this. But this man of God, mm -hmm. he just mm -hmm. felt so much respect for and wanted mm -hmm. him, asked him to be a spiritual mentor for a season. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so awesome. it, we, the seeds are planted. You know, you just never know when those seeds get planted. Well, and, and I don't. I hope I didn't say that when I told you guys to, when they're doing the premarital counseling. If a, you got an unbeliever versus a, a, a believer, I'm not saying that I've never not married. Right. That I hope you guys didn't. I wasn't no. saying that. No. All I'm saying is when I'm talking to them or speaking to them, I, you, we need to point out the fact yeah. of some of the. Uh, uh, difficulties, the things yeah. of the different cultures that sure. you're going to be up against. Do you, under, do you understand that? And I have to do that. It's like, okay, when I, I know, like one I just did not too long ago, is like, I know that this guy, the, the, the guy was born again, but the wife was not. And I did everything that I knew to do to have her accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. But her parents are uh, preachers, pastors, I don't know what, what you call them, of Scientology. And uh, she, she did not, at that table where we sat there, she did not pray uh, a sinner's prayer. Uh, but I did say when, uh, and I used the word Easter, you know, if I would have said Passover, they would have been lost. They wouldn't know what I was talking about. But I said, well, when Easter comes around, I, I know that, that he celebrates the resurrection because I've known him from a, a kid, and I know his parents. And so they celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead. How will you and your kids what, what will you do? What will you tell the kids? You know, and I said, you guys are going to have to understand. Of course, the husband was totally quiet, wouldn't say anything, because here I am pointing out some things, you know, that the wife has to make some decisions on, and he wouldn't help with me at all, you know, which is understand, I understand. But, but the thing was, she never did make a, a, a decision, and as far as I know, I love her. She's a part of our family, and, uh, but... From what I understand, just in her talking to me, if she was to die, would she go to heaven? And and I would have to say, no, I, I, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. I even said, well, if you, well, she said, well, we're going to raise the kids at his church, you know, here at the church. I mean, it was me and Skyway. And I said, okay, so then what do you do when the kids become born again and they know that mom's not born again? Aren't the kids going to want mom mm -hmm. to be in heaven with them? You know, so I just had to do some hard kind of one-liners. I, I just I did that for about, I don't know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and then I just, you know, the seeds are planted. You can't, you know, hammer them or whatever, but you got to put it out there so that they know, and they, you know, when they cross that bridge, and hope, and I left it, and I did it very uh, gently, very 
uh, you know, easily so that I hope I left the door open that they would come back if they had any questions and they would talk to me. But I, I did do that. And then there has been other times when I had a, a lady that was doing a marriage with a guy from a Muslim faith, and I, and I did tell her, you know, this is, you're totally unequally yoked, and do you understand that dynamic that you're unequally yoked? And she said, yes, I do. And I said, so you still want to marry this man? And she said, yes, I do. And I said it in front of him, because folks, when you get to the bottom line, and now you're the leader, and now you're going to mm -hmm. unite someone, we have to kind of say some difficult, kind of tough, you don't want to, you don't, you're not, you don't be mean, you don't want to be mean, but you have to be real, and the, and the reality is, if you know the different backgrounds and different cultures, uh, the male-dominated, uh, oriented type of thing, she's going to be under his foot. And whether she realizes that or not, no, he treats me like a queen, I'm blah, 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 and I'm like, okay, of course, you know how long that one lasted. That one didn't last, that one didn't last very long at all. But, so you guys got to kind of just figure that out whenever you're uh, doing the premarital counseling and stuff, kind of what you want to do there. So. All right, I spent, spent a lot of time on, on that type of thing because I tell you what, that's, you got to kind of get the horse in front of the cart uh, before you do this. So hopefully what will happen is people will be, they're both Christians, they both love God, those are a lot easier. But that doesn't mean that they're not still going to have difficulties because of the relationships and, and stuff like that, that that goes along. But it just, people that have a different culture or saved and not saved, uh, unequally yoked, they've already kind of started the game off um, that it can make it a little bit, it can make it a little bit harder, okay? So just so you guys kind of know and understand all that. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to the, um, okay, let's do this. Let's say you've already, you met with them, you talked with them, you did all this kind of stuff that I've already talked to you about. You've gone through this book, you, you, you feel good, uh, you know, you've met with them uh, uh, once or twice. In regards to this, mm -hmm. so then the next, the and what I do is usually at the end of when I've done premarital, I'll say, okay, let's plan the wedding. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a meeting that you have to have. So what you got to do is you got to plan the wedding. So what we're going to do is, if you can get these, um, now there's really like three different sheets, but these same two sheets right here. You see this sheet that's blank? Mm -hmm. That's going to give you a really good uh, idea of some different things that are going to go on with a wedding that you can ask. A lot of times, the lady already knows exactly what she wants, what, when, and where, and what position. So that makes it pretty good. But this is a blank uh, sheet for you guys to, uh, uh, to you guys to use when you're sitting down with them. I'm talking about this blank sheet. It says wedding notes, and I don't have everything on there, but I've got a lot of stuff on there that will help you as you're going down through. If someone really doesn't know anything about how to do a wedding. Or want to do a wedding, this will this will get you some miles down the road here, okay? Okay, so one of the things that you're doing when you're talking to them and you're doing this, um, uh, you're putting this wedding together, when you put this wedding together, what you're telling them is, what we decide on today, what you guys want to do, I want you to know whenever we do, now this is, let me back up a second. You'll do two different types of weddings. You'll do one wedding where you're like, you're it. You're the wedding coordinator, you're the one that puts the thing together, you're the one that meets with them, uh, you're the one that when they do the wedding practice, you're going to be telling them what to do and where to go and where to stand. That's one way. Another way is if the couple has a wedding coordinator, okay, that's a home run if you ever get one of those. Because all we do is come in and we just, we just go down and read the scripture verse and pray and do the vows. It makes it a lot easier. They tell them where to stand, what to do, and all that kind of good stuff. But the majority of times that I've done it is I'm kind of the wedding, we're kind of the wedding coordinator. We, we make everything go, okay? Especially even if it's off-site. Maybe it's a backyard. Maybe it's, you know, this or that. If they have a, if they, if they have a lot of money, if they have money that they want to use, they'll usually have a wedding coordinator. It doesn't even have to be a lot, but I mean, because if you go to an off-site place, a resort, something like that, there's usually a wedding coordinator that uh, is usually uh, a part of that thing. And then they help put things together, okay? So then how you conduct a wedding rehearsal will be different. But let's let's talk about this right here. Let's just say, hey, we're going to be the one doing this service. So so what we do is, as we're putting this thing together, you let them know, okay, whatever we decide here, I'm going to, whenever we do the wedding rehearsal, I'm going to do it exactly like you guys want me to do that. Because what will happen inevitably, you've got uh, 
the mother, the mother-in-law, the bossy aunt, uh, whatever, uh, bossy girlfriend. Uh, when you get to when you get to the wedding rehearsal, they're going to go, oh no 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 no, let's do it this way or whatever. That that I'm just warning you that could possibly happen. And what you're able to tell the bride and the groom is, I'm going to do it exactly like you've told me to do it here. And so if you say this is the way we're going to do this, this is the way we're going to do this. You can't vacillate, you know, back and forth because then you've got. 30 opinions mm -hmm. of what's going to go on. So when we come in here, you want to just make this, you know, just this way. And only a couple times have I ran into a little bit of problem where I had to address it right from where I was standing, saying, oh, this is how the bride and groom want to do it, so that's okay. That was, a, that was a great idea, but we're going to do it this way. Okay, now, and then I don't even, mm -hmm. I don't even wait for a response, you know, whether right. it's yes, no, or, you know, <laughs> whatever. I don't wait for a response. You just move on. But those are the type of things when you're leading, you're the authority, you got to do it. You know, if they say they're going to start at four, that's the mm -hmm. wedding rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Is everybody here? Yes. Okay, let's start. Boom. You start it. You know, type of thing. So you want to you want to take you want to take a charge doing that. But what you're doing is you want to let them know. Hey, there's a lot of here. Let me just read this thing. Wedding rehearsal. Along with this joyous occasion comes a lot of stress, expectations, and dreams that might cause uh, some problems during the wedding rehearsal. You'll meet with a couple prior to the wedding rehearsal. Find out how they would like their wedding ceremony to go. Once you have found out what they want, then you're ready for the wedding rehearsal. By doing this, you are letting them know of the potential hurt feelings. And I actually tell them, you let them know the potential hurt feelings that might take place during the rehearsal if things are not done a certain way. So the reason we're doing what we're doing, we're putting this thing together, is so I can help you. We'll make this thing go really, really smooth. Okay? So that's, that's just something that we... Uh, uh, that we, we do this. So here's some steps of the for the wedding rehearsal. You know, there's a whole other uh, sheet that Pastor Greg has, and I know I'm giving you guys a bunch of stuff. It's this little sheet right here that has weddings on it, and basically these five bullet points that I'm going to do, he's given places where if you wanted to, you could write notes. So I'm just letting you know that's what this other sheet is. Uh, it just says, and it just says weddings. It talks up at the top, our greatest joys shared by a couple is their wedding. That's the, if you wanted to make some notes, you could make it off of that. But the five bullet points that I'm going to cover right here is what this whole sheet is about. So if you're wondering, hey, when's Pastor Sam going to talk about this sheet? I'm getting ready to do it right now, okay? Okay. So, the wedding rehearsal, what you want to do is uh, you want to get, get everybody around. I don't know where you might be, if you're in the backyard, or let's just say there's a I don't know, let's just say there's a platform, but uh, what I want to do is, I put on here, you want to start with prayer, but what you want to do is you want to place everybody on the stage exactly where they're going to be standing. So you're finding out uh, when you're meeting with them, you're finding out how many groomsmen, you're finding out how many uh, bridesmaids they have. And so you're starting to do this wedding rehearsal. Okay, tell you what, let me, let me just back up, let me just back up a second. Let's look at this thing called the wedding notes. Because I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because this is this formats what uh, the next step that I'm going to talk about here is. So on these wedding notes, I put down the couple's name, the date, uh, what time do they want you to arrive at the wedding. And one, one thing that's really good, you need to find out what time do you want the groomsmen to be there. You know, so that when you're making this announcement, when you're doing the wedding rehearsal, you can say, hey, they're taking pictures at this time, or they want all the groomsmen to. Um, either be dressed and be here at this time, or hey, we're all going to dress. You know, so those are just different type of things that you'll want to say. What time do you want them to arrive? You want to find out if they've got a sound person, and uh, will they be do? Will they have a DJ? So is it going to be live, or uh, will it just be uh, CDs? I've done a lot of things where, like, I've done some backyard things where the what they do is they put a CD in, they turn the the CD player on, and that's that's all it is to where they've got all kinds of different songs that they're playing throughout the thing, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. But you want to be able to coordinate with, if there is a sound person at the time of the wedding, you're going to want to talk to that sound person to make sure, does he have you doing a lapel mic, are you going to do a handheld, and then make sure he knows which songs are wanting to be played, because you're the one that sat down with the couple and got those songs together. Now the couple will bring all those songs, they'll bring the CDs, but you want to check with the DJ to make sure everything's okay. Because the bride is not checking that. She's expecting everything's going to just mm -hmm. go right down and go just right, and she's looking at us to make sure that thing has gone on properly, okay? Okay, so 
Background music, it usually begins around 30 minutes before, so you put down a time frame when you want the background music. And you just ask a couple. You know, it's instrumental, it's jazz, it's country, it's, uh, you know, whatever their, whatever their flavor is. Then you say, would you like grandmothers to be seated? Sometimes people want their grandmas to be seated, and sometimes they don't, you know, type of thing. But I ask them, would, do you have grandmas? You know, would you like them to be seated? No, he's just got one pair. No, we'll just let grandma sit down. Okay, so I just ask. But that can actually be part of the grandmother, can actually be part of the seating ceremony, okay? If you start at four, one of the things might be that the, the grandma comes down and is, is actually seated, okay? Another thing is, are you going to do uh, unity candles? Sometimes they'll do lighting unity candles. That's more kind of old school, back when I got married, that you had the, you know, you lit the unity candles. But sometimes people will still uh, light unity candles. If they do, the moms could actually... Uh, as part of the service, the moms can walk down together with a lighter and they can light the, outs, the two outside uh, lights that are usually up on the platform or uh, close to where we're doing the ceremony and then the moms would actually take their seats. So you can say, hey, are you going to uh, have unity candles? And if the answer is yes, then you can say, hey, the moms can do that. Would you like your moms to go down and light those unity candles? So I always ask that question. And then the other thing is, if the moms are lighting the unity candles, the moms don't need to be seated, they'll just sit down. But if they're not doing unity candles, the moms, they might want to escort, have ushers actually escort the moms uh, down to the seats, okay? And the moms always are sitting, the moms always sit on the outside rows. Everybody familiar with that? You like these are your chairs? So moms always get this seat. They're always on, always on the corner. If you have, let's just talk about this for a second. If you have uh, blended families and you've got uh, um, uh, mom and dad are not married anymore, if mom and dad's relationship are not, you know, super great, uh, what happens is uh, dad and his new wife would sit on the second row. Okay, that's just that's kind of how the protocol is. If everybody's fine, they can all sit on the same row, but mom always. Catches the corner seat, okay, for both moms, moms and dads. I mean, if if the families are good, they're the blended families, they're okay and stuff. They could actually sit on the front row. What where it really is kind of the preference is, do they like each other? Do they not like each other? Are, are they uh, civil or are they not civil? And you you find that out from um, the the couple that's, that's getting married. And again, that's one of the harder things that you have to. It's not a hard thing, but I mean, it's just another thing you have to make sure to let them know, hey, dad will be sitting on, you know, that second row and stuff. So that's, sometimes that's just kind of how we have to do that. But that's how we do it when you got a, a blended family. But moms always sit on that side. So, and these are always, when you face out, when you're facing out, the, the bride is always on your right-hand side and the groom is always on your left-hand side, okay? So when you're facing out, that's where the bride and, and groom is. So when you're facing out, this is like, this is the bride. And these are the groom. Okay. Okay. So the moms are going to be seated. So then, what you need to find out is, hey, are, are the groomsmen's are they going to are they going to walk down? The, a lot of times, what happens is sometimes the ladies like the, the bridesmaids to actually walk in with the groom, and they walk in and then they split and they take their place. Or a lot of the weddings that I'm doing now is they want the, the pastor, the groom, and the groomsmen all to walk in at one time, and they all walk in at one time. And then the ladies all come down looking all sharp and pretty by themselves. And then they get their pictures taken. So there's two different ways that you can do that. You just need to ask, hey, how would you like to do that? She'll already know. You won't, uh, you're not going to have to instruct her. But anyway, those are the two different options. Just so you know, you know, they come down as couples or uh, the pastor and the, 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 uh, the groom and all the groomsmen come in and stuff. So, and then, of course, if you do something like that, whether you're doing a backyard or whatever, um, you know, you're like the pastor or whatever, you don't normally go down that middle aisle. You normally will go down a side aisle. And, of course, you as uh, the pastor as a chaplain, you're right here. And you want the groom to be down here on the ground. Or if you're not on a platform flat, you just want him out in front. And then you've got all the, um, all the groomsmen that are kind of like this. So you'll have to set them in place because... Um, if you don't have a wedding coordinator, just so they kind of um, are at a little bit of angle just for a camera shot, okay? Just very easy. They just, they're just stand shoulder to shoulder, and that's how they're doing it. And then what will happen is the ladies will come up this way, and then they'll do the same, same type of thing. 
They start from here. And you'll write these ladies' names down, okay? Because they start from the, the, bride, the maid of honor. This is a maid of honor. She comes in last, okay? So whatever the names are, who's walking with who, however that is, you get their names. Because you're going to have to tell them, you're going to have to place them where they're going to be, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you have, to, you have to know what their names is. So what you do is you ask the bride and the groom. They already know what their pecking order is the wrong thing. They already know what their, how they want them uh, situated or how they want them mm -hmm. stood. So you'll just, you'll just put all that together. What was that? Pecking order was the right word. Okay, is that the right word? Okay. So anyway, so you, you, you figure that out. Here's another thing on here. Um, ushers, do they want to roll out an aisle runner? Does anybody know what an aisle runner is? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if they still do that or not, but they used to do that a lot. Um, but a lot of times what happens now is just the little girl usually comes out and throws petals. That's usually kind of where that, they don't really use the aisle runners that much, but I, you know, just throw it out there. Um, they might say, well, what is that? And it's kind of a cool thing, you know, uh, that they do. So especially if the aisle runner works or if it doesn't work, then it's just part of the wedding and it's something in the video that you can show everybody when the guys have to bend over and roll it out, you know, bent over. That's what happened at our wedding. So, and then after, um, after the bridesmaids are already up there and stuff, then what will happen is the ring bearer comes up. Normally the ring bearer will stand uh, by uh, the best man and usually stand right there. Uh, a lot of times now they think it's really cute that, that really, really young kids that are just not going to stand up there <laughs> and they're not going to hang. Yeah. And uh, normally they just, they got the pillow, but it's usually fake rings that are on there. The best man should have the rings, okay? Just throw that out there to you. And what I do is I will ask them, because they're going to think this is cute, darling, and blah, 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 but it's going to be an interruption to the max. You know, so what you got to ask them is, will little Willie stand by <laughs> Freddie here, you know, type of thing. They go, well, we think he will. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, who's mom, you know, and, and where will mom be sitting? Will mom be sitting right there? I said, I'll tell you what, once he walks up, why don't you have mom just grab him? And, you know, we can bring them up there for pictures later, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I really try to throw that out there. But if they say, no, I really wanted to stand there, then it's their gig. And if the guy just messes up, then, I, hey, I tried. You know, but I really try to really try to say, hey, you know, for pictures and having them walk up and stand there, that's really cool. But then have mom come and get them. Especially because they just get them younger and younger and younger. And they, you know, how do you make a two-year-old want to stand there? Want to stand there? So it's just not in their grit. It's not in their grit. You know? so, but anyway, that's just something to look out for. And of course, the little flower girl, she usually does actually, she usually does stay up there. And she'll stand over by the maid, she'll stand by the maid of honor, okay? And that's the flower girl. I've never really had a flower girl go south on me, but it could happen, but they're they're just so into the moment and what they're doing, and the little girls are just so so much mature at an early age. They just they just love it, they want to do the whole thing. So flower girls usually pretty good. You can see here where we have songs. There should be a, usually with the, the groomsmen, the grandmas, moms, all that kind of stuff, whatever background music is being played, that music could still be the music in which they're walking into. But whenever you uh, have, the, the, whenever the bridesmaids, let's just say the bridesmaids are walking in by themselves, you switch the song because that means, okay, hey, you know, game is on, and there's usually a different song, and you can usually ask them, you know, this song was the only hope. Once the groomsmen are up there, the bridesmaid, the flower girl, and the ring bearer are up there, you know, obviously you have what's called the wedding march. Uh, usually it's canon and D. That's what the wedding march is called. A lot of, the majority of weddings I do, that's what they want to do. They usually do the canon and D. So, but then that's the next song. That, when, whenever that song comes on, that means dad and um, the bride are in the back, and that's when I usually say, let's all stand. And then that's when uh, dad will, will bring... Uh, We'll bring uh, the, the family in, or bring the bride in, I mean. Yeah. So father and bride to enter. <clears throat> and then I'll do, like, so anyway. Man, I'm looking at the time, and I'm looking at things I still need to tell you, and I'm like, this is not working. <laughs> um, so what you're doing at the wedding rehearsal, uh, well, when, as soon as you get here, you know, first thing I said, start with prayer, but even really before that, I need to fluff these things. You need to get everybody's attention. You need to get everybody on the stage and put in the place where they're going to be. And here's the reason why. Number one, You've called attention. Uh, the parents are sitting where the parents are sitting. Uh, the bride is actually right here. Dad is right here. Um, and you've got, all, you've got all these people standing where they're going to stand. And you can say, hey, this is where you will be positioned when you get up here to the wedding. 
And then what you do is you go through the whole, the whole things that I've got written down here, these notes. You go down to the exact thing of what, what, they're, what we're going to do so they can see what they're going to do. And basically the only thing they really need to do is when it gets to, um, when it gets to who has the rings, the best man turns around and gives you the rings. Okay? But what I, what I do, once I get them in this place here, I get them all set up, then what I'll do is, I'll, I'll, then I'll open with a word of prayer. Say, hey, let's open with a word of prayer. And you might have friends or whatever just mingling around, no big deal. But you've got everybody where they need to be, so then you just open up with a word of prayer, just invite the presence of God there. And then as we go through this thing, mm -hmm. we've got a statement of purpose, which basically is just a welcome. I do an opening prayer. This thing is called a covenant marriage statement. Basically, it's a prayer of release. What I try to do in this book, and again, I'm just, I'm, you guys are just catching some highlights here. When you start to do a wedding, I'll go through this thing all over again with you and help you. Okay, it's a lot of information, a lot of information. Mm -hmm. But basically, what I like to do is if, if the bride and groom want to, what I, what I like to do is I, I like to involve the parents who actually give uh, their consent that they're doing like a prayer of release. They're actually releasing their son and daughter to marry one another. And so what it's called is called a prayer, uh, a prayer release, and it's also a marriage covenant statement. Because what it will say is, you are now leaving your father and mother, and you're cleaving to one another. This is before, the, they, I haven't even said who's given this woman to be married to this man yet. But we're making a covenant declaration that you're now leaving your mother and father, and you're going to establish your home. <clears throat> you, know, you do it to the, to, the girl, to the groom and to the bride, and then you also tell the parents. And you parents, and you have them up here, because what you'll end up doing, if they'll do this covenant thing, uh, dad's, you know, dad's right here, uh, the other mom can be right here, and then the other parents, you know, you want them all basically there together, okay? This is if they're doing that a prayer release. And I, I say to them, you know, do you guys promise to uh, be an example to whoever, whatever, whatever their names are getting married? Uh, and to help them encourage their marriage and to